to address the issues facing Tennesseans today. From 10 News, this is Inside Tennessee. Good morning and welcome to Inside Tennessee. I'm your moderator, John Becker. We turn our focus to education on this Sunday morning and to a nine-member board that controls more than $420 million of your tax dollars. And it's a school board that is in transition. The November election produced a new member in District 2. We heard from Tracy Sanger last week. This week, we focus on the new board chair and vice chair, Chair Mike McMillan is here. He hails from the 8th District. Welcome. And along with him, Vice Chair Doug Harris from District 3. Thank you both for being here. Thanks for Thank having you. us. Absolutely. Good morning. Good morning. We're going to turn to our panel for the introductions and then get to questions on the end is Don Bosch. He runs his own law firm and is a Democrat. Good morning, John. Good morning. Susan Richardson-Williams is a Republican. She runs her own PR firm. And good morning. Good morning. Mike Danilla is an investigative reporter here at Channel 10. Good morning, John. Good morning. Gentlemen, uh, let's start with priorities. Chair, um, you're new to that seat. What is priority one for you on the Knox County School Board? I think my top priority at this particular time would be to uh, uh, try to get the, the teachers back to focusing on teaching. That's not to say that they, they haven't been doing a good job, but... Uh, there was a time not too long ago when everybody worked together collectively for the betterment of the of the students and the and the system as a whole and somehow or another we've we've kind of polarized things here the last couple of years to to a certain extent and it doesn't i don't think it has to be uh us versus them or or or, or groups one group pitted against another i, I would like to, to 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 feel like that as a former teacher that maybe i could do something to to make that situation improve the situation. Doug, uh, the chair addressed it, but a lot has been made about this board being split. Um, some for the superintendent, some uh, against the superintendent, or not really in favor of the superintendent. Do you see it that way, or do you think that's overblown? I think in the last couple of months, it probably would be a, a good characterization that the board was probably anti-McIntyre. But I think now that with Tracy Sanger coming on, we're really not sure exactly where she stands. She said that she's open-minded and is willing to work with the superintendent. So I think it's a new day, and I'm looking forward to the board working together and to try to do what's best for students and, and to try to get our focus on students and what we can do to... Uh, increase our achievement and give people opportunity uh, we'll, for our community. We'll talk about the report card for the district, but what grade would you give the superintendent right now? I want to ask both of you that question. Doug, we'll start with you. I'd give him a B. And Chair? Um, overall, I guess I would, I would probably give him a C+. Plus. And where could he most um, improve? Well, I, I, by his own admission, uh, he he does he's not that much of a, a people person uh, when when and they did the survey we didn't do the survey uh, when seventy percent of Knox County teachers say that Knox County is no longer a good place to work then you have a problem whether you realize it or not you you do have a problem and that's what I would like to see us he he says that that's one of his top priorities that he's going to work on that I'm, I'm not sure exactly uh, how well we could evaluate that at the end of the year but we'll be able to see whether there's some improvement. touch on that comment because when you drill down on some of those studies nationwide with other school districts, and I spent a little time looking at this this week, that the, the number one factor for teachers is salary. And we know that in Knoxville, and, and I know a lot of teachers admirably will say, no, it's about teaching, it's about quality of life. But at the end of the day, the teachers have to feed their families, and they need to be compensated fairly. And particularly, they need to be compensated relative to surrounding communities. So that said, given the state of our Knox County budget and our funding, how can we do something to fund the teachers better to possibly improve morale? Well... <laughs> Big question. Yeah, it, it is, but I've been associated with Knox County Schools for about four decades, about 40 years, either as a teacher or on the school board. 
And the last year to year and a half is the first time that I did, did not hear teachers saying, we want more money. Now, they would like more money, but that's not their top priority. So, they, want, they want a settling situation where they don't have to worry about looking over their shoulder and, and Does it and only get fired. better than if Dr. McIntyre goes, however he goes? I, I, won't, I won't say that for sure because I think that's, that's speculative. Now, it, it, I guess to, to answer the, the question you asked originally, he's not really been able to secure any new money to speak of, the natural growth money. Uh, and Realistically, I, with this county commission and mayor, I don't see any taxes being raised, any significant amount of, of new money. And we've lost, it's, there's not been a lot of publicity about it, but we've lost an awfully lot of, of veteran teachers, good teachers that are going to other, other counties for less money. Well then Doug, the same question to you. Does the problem get better with teachers? only if Dr. McIntyre leaves as chief. In my opinion, this is not really as much about McIntyre as it is about education reform. So the answer would be, who do you replace him with? If you replace him with somebody that's against school reform, then maybe the teachers would uh, be more amenable to a new uh, superintendent. If we get somebody that wants to continue accountability, t testing for students and also for the teachers, um, and some of these other reform-minded initiatives, then I think that the superintendent would have some of the same problems that he's got now. I don't think it's about McIntyre. Uh, his communication skills, to me, can be improved, but they're pretty darn good. I think we're lucky to have him. We've got to take a quick break. We'll get some more questions from our panel. Again, thanks for both of you for being with us on this Sunday morning. We're back with more right after this. We're back on this Sunday morning with two members of the Knox County School Board. Again, we talked about it being a board in transition. Chair McMillan is here as well as Doug Harris, the vice chair. Um, I want to ask you about this $3 million that Mayor Burchett has been talking about and the accountability on that. It was for reading, reading programs, literacy, and he is saying that so far he hadn't been able to identify where it's made a difference. Where, where do you all stand on that? Do you think it has made a difference? Yeah, can I start on that? Sure. Doug? Um, I do think it's made a difference. And I'll tell you, I spent three hours yesterday at Cedar Bluff Elementary School with Janet Sexton. She's in charge of that program and also the um, principal there and then some of the teachers looking at what's going on in the classroom. And the day before, I uh, was at principal day, for a day at Sarah Moore Green. And so, and I've been working on this. I actually met with Dean Rice and to help him get some information to the mayor on this program. So I've looked at it really closely. And I'm convinced that if we lose that money, and I can tell you, if you hear from principals and teachers, they're going to be very upset if that money goes away. Now, of course, we could try to reappropriate it from our existing budget, but as Mike could attest, that's going to be hard to do. That program is very important for two reasons. For one reason, there's a lot of coaches that are going out and helping teachers uh, just learn how to teach kids how to read. Coaches defined as not as instructional athletic coaches, coaches yes. right. reading coaches, but yes. It, but is it working though? I mean, I looked at the numbers and look kind of mixed. Like maybe one grade's working and the yeah. other's not. I think you know if you look at the we've in first and second grade the SAT 10 showed that I think it's working. Uh, it's not as where we'd want it to be. But what I learned yesterday, we still have some work to do on training our teachers to teach kids how to read. It's not very. It's a hard task to teach somebody how to read. And evidently, when students uh, come out of the, uh, a college setting, they're not totally prepared to teach um, reading skills. And so we've got to invest in training our teachers to make sure that we can get kids where they need to be. Chair, your read on that program? The results that I've seen are, are mixed at best. Uh, I thought, I agree with, with the, the idea that, you know, by the third grade that it's really critical that a, a kid be able to read because if they get, if they're behind at that point, uh, they'll, who knows when they will get caught up or if they'll get caught up. The, the, the problem, I'm not sold on coaches. And just because principals say that, that they're, they're helping tremendously, you gotta remember that principals work for one person. 
They don't work really for the board. There's one person that's in charge of that. And uh, in many instances, I think they tend to uh, identify with the uh, doctrine that's being well, promoted. Have you watched a coach work with a teacher with reading skills? Have you actually watched that no, process? I not. Wouldn't I that be a fair thing to do before we become critical of it and sort of... Well, I'm, I'm just going from... from People that I know that are in the system, teachers. Uh, so you've heard that, a complaint that, from teachers that have been well, coached by reading coaches. No, I've, I've heard from. I'm talking about the, the the literary coaches in general, not necessarily just the reading. We've got all kinds of academic coaches, and th that was what I was saying. In in reading, particularly, it it, it may be a, a, a totally different situation but it looks to me like that you could hire uh, teaching assistants at the direction of the and you can hire them for a lot less than you can uh, a, a coach well, and, and well, the more people you've got now, and I think the more people you've got I to wish work Mike with. Mike would have been with me yesterday first of all the passion from not only the principal and uh, Janet Sexton the supervisor but the teachers for this program and the coach I was with the coach and I watched her do specific things that I mean it's 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 as nuanced as saying P instead of puh when you're teaching somebody how to read. I mean, I was like, I was blown away by the nuances that really are involved in teaching. And I can tell you what, the principals that I've talked to, this is not something that they're doing because McIntyre is telling them to do it. They are passionate about getting what the students need and the teachers need some help to get what the students need. Well, if they can't read by the third grade, we, we know there's all kind of data to show that you're really doomed, uh, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And we have some schools here that have really low literacy ratings. So what do you do? If you, if you take, if that money goes away, I mean, yeah, every teacher should be able to teach a child to read if they're employed in the school district. Mm -hmm. But if they're not, they're not coming out prepared, and you don't have that additional money to, to teach these, what happens? The schools are failing when it comes to that. Also, I think, too, and, and I hope I'm kind of sort of asking the same question, is how long, if we're still getting mixed results, how long do you continue with the reading program? Because, you, you know, you get mixed results for this batch of K through th K through 2, and then they move on. And so then you got your same, your new K through 2. Do you get a mixed batch with them, or do the, I, I, does the improvement come with the students, the length of the reading coaches working with the teachers? And that batch. I well, mean, the question I think you always need to ask too is if we take it away, where we, where we maybe have been? We could have been a lot less than right. Right. Sure. Now. No, yeah, so, so that's that's yeah. where I would start there is to not make the assumption that you know everything would have stayed the same if we took those reading coaches away. But I mean. To kind of go with what Don was asking Mike earlier, we've got to have more resources, and I've been a, an advocate for more resources. I'm a conservative Republican. I, I would hate to see a tax increase, but we've got to have one. Our community at some point is going to have to decide, is education really one of those uh, pillars that we're going to build our community on, or is it just going to be something that we talk about? And we don't need a huge tax increase, but we need about $40 million. Technology would help on this reading program. We have to have a one-to-one. -one. I hope we get to talk about that uh, later on. A one-to-one -one technology in every school. The teachers need. We need more teachers. We need you know more resources in the classroom as well. I wouldn't argue that we that we couldn't use more teachers, but with the available money that we have, it it, it boils down to you use it. Uh, how can you use it to, to, to the well, best benefit? Do you you get get more? More? Well, but if, but if, we're, if we're not going to get more, what the point I was making earlier is, and I've asked some elementary principals about this, which would you prefer? If you could have uh, a certified teacher or if you could have two aides or uh, in, instructional assistants, whatever you want to call them, uh, which would benefit you more? Now, in general, not just reading, but in general at, at your school. And every one of them said they would prefer to have two people that they could work with because the, the teacher could supervise them and they could follow the teacher's instruction, work individually. We, we've got to take another quick break. We'll be back with more questions from our panel right after this.
back on this Sunday morning with a conversation about schools. The board voted to get rid of the SAT-10 testing for the youngest students in the district. Um, let's talk about that for a moment and, and where you go forward. And you brought this up, Chair, about um, teachers being feeling like the evaluations of them were a little onerous. I think Doug addressed it as well. Um, do you think this is a, a way that uh, you'll bring teachers back into the fold a little bit as a board? I would hope so. I, I mean, we, I, I personally heard by email, letter, phone call uh, from a lot of, of elementary teachers that, that, you know, K through 2. And uh, all the ones that called me were, were saying that it was detrimental, that kids were not ready. And, you know, I'll be the first one. I spent my years at high school level. I'll be the first one to admit that I'm not that familiar with that that level but I would much prefer when you hear that many people that are involved on a daily basis I would prefer to hear from them as opposed to some supervisor or somebody that hadn't been in the class, in charge of a classroom in quite some time. The district is saying one of the consequences of this will be that those teachers, instead of being evaluated by their performance in their individual classroom, will now be evaluated based on the school result. And for high-performing teachers, that actually may be a detriment. They may lose um, some money because of it, uh, because they're going to be evaluated on this uh, school-wide evaluation rather than an individual classroom. Is that an unintended consequence or do you think that's fair? I think it's kind of odd that we discovered that just immediately after we voted on it. Uh, it, it. It almost makes one wonder if it was punitive. But uh, Punitive by who? Well, Dr. McIntyre and some of the board members didn't want the vote to go through. So no, yeah. they didn't want it to go through. Uh, they, they they were pro for it. Yeah. So I, I mean, it, it, the the teachers have to live have to live with it. What they were telling us was that there were other tests that that, that they could use to evaluate the kids. Now uh, and that's but, not what we're hearing now from the district. They're saying it's an either or situation. But as far as you're talking about, you're talking about evaluating the. The, the teachers themselves. Yeah. yeah. And, Doug, you know, you I guess that's. support the SAT 10, didn't you? Mm -hmm. I mean, I know you voted against it, but that's. Yeah, I, I voted think a against it because of parliamentary yeah. procedure. I could have brought it back but, up potentially, but I'm, I'm going to tell you, this has been really hard for me to, to swallow as a, not only as a parent and a board member but as a, as a business person. We're not going to be able to evaluate reading now until somebody's almost in the fourth grade. So you think about it. A parent puts a kid in school and they're, we're really not going to know how they stack up until the fourth grade, right before they enter the fourth grade because they take the TCAP in the third grade. Uh, I do agree that the I think it was a small group of, of teachers that were pushing to have this SAT-10 thrown out. I had no complaints from any parents, uh, very few teachers that complained. And I do will give them credit. I think we probably should have stopped it in kindergarten. But we needed to do this in first and second grade. And I can tell you there's a lot of support from the teacher ranks for a test in the first and second grade. Is there another test, though? Uh, you know, you hear about this test, and it's three or four days of, of a little child, yeah. and it's an auditory test. and and uh, you picture little Johnny crying because right. the teachers are talking. About, is there another? Is there another test you can give? Yeah, there's I mean, a, this there's one just Ames, seems. There's a, I think there's an Ames test and a Northwestern test. But I think there's a contradiction of what we were hearing. What the reality is. They're trained to only have the test 10 minutes at a time and then go take a 30-minute break and then come back and do 10 more minutes. So if a teacher actually was trying to have a kindergarten student sit down for an hour straight, that's not what they were trained to do. So when somebody was coming up and giving that example, we were all just kind of sitting there thinking, well, that's not the way they were trained. So um, Nobody ever disputed it, though. To my knowledge, so that it was, I think it was far and few between. Well, Dr. McIntyre didn't dispute. No, none of the yeah. staff people disputed. To, to the to the best of my knowledge, it looks to me like uh, the staff people disputed all the time behind the scenes, but they usually don't respond well, in the board meetings unless we I, ask. Well, sometimes they do. Yeah. But you're, you're you're right for the most part that they don't. But uh, you know, it, it, when it looked like it was going to come before the board if there was some alternative, some middle ground, so to speak, it looks to me, and I don't know that, that 
that there was, but it looks to me like that that, that would have been time to have discussed it rather than just, you know. Let me, can so, I make just one quick point, too? The problem with public education in general, not just Knox County, is there's great inflation, and I experience this as a parent. And so a lot of our, we've got a study on this. You can read it. It's online. A lot of our students will get A's and B's and they're not proficient in English or math. So as a parent, I need a standardized test that I can look at once a year to see really where my kid stacks up because potentially the grades will not tell you really where they are. And along that line of thinking, um, the state moved to Common Core standards um, to address that very issue. The, our own governor sat in this program and said, we lie to parents, teachers, and students for years in Tennessee, telling them they were doing a heck of a lot better than they were compared to the rest of the country. Where do you as board chair want to see the legislature go with that this year? Should they repeal the standards? Should they modify them? I, I think probably modify them. I, I, I don't think people are against higher standards. Uh, you know, um, our society today pretty much demands if you're going to be competitive. It's in the implementation of it. And, uh, you know, I, somebody told me at lunch, I, I don't know that this is correct, but that uh, the uh, thing that the governor had set up to where people could make comments that uh, they told it was like 150,000 or more uh, comments thus far, and 98% of them have been opposed to, to Common Core. Opposed to testing or opposed to the well, I don't, concept I don't of know Common Core? I don't know. Because I, I just, it, it just it baffles me to think that people would not want their children to perform proficiently. I can understand the legitimate discussion about the testing methodology, but Mike, I'm just sorry to think that, that, that there's really a significant portion of our population population that thinks that keeping children to higher standards is not a good thing. No, no, I, I don't think so. I, I'm just telling you what, what I was told about the, the comments. I really don't know that much. <laughs> Let's hope the, we don't base school board policy on lunchtime gossip. Mike. <laughs> right, right. Well, but but it, obviously it's, it's, it's going to be more controversial than, than I originally anticipated. Chair? It's very, is it time to leave? Time. <laughs> oh, sorry. Well, I was just going to comment. It's very concerning to me that if what you say is true, that we're not going to be testing the children until fourth grade on TCAPs, and, and we have well, no idea. Well, the scores right before fourth grade. Before fourth grade, okay. whether they can read or not, that's our problem. Yeah. We're going to end on that point. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. We appreciate thank it. You. Appreciate thank it. you. Back with our talk around right after this. Back on this Sunday morning, Don Bosch, uh, what would you make of our discussion? Uh, frightening and interesting. And I probably ought to leave it there because I'm going to bite my tongue till there's blood in my mouth. You also had a point uh, about a, a lawyer from Knoxville who has a new position yeah, in Nashville. Di different thing. Dwight Tarwater, counsel to the governor. As I said, it's the most important position in government that nobody's heard about. Really, the, the uh, ear and sound. Because it advises the governor on all legislation that comes across his desk, all judicial picks, all legal matters, is absolutely an essential advisor to the governor. Herb Slatery became AG, and, uh, and now Dwight Tarwater is the new counsel to the governor. We appreciate you watching. Thanks very much, Don Bosch, with the closing bell. Wow, that never happens. So. <laughs> on our talk round, we'll see you next week on Inside Tennessee.